All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our fourth session of sustainability. Got my drink here, a little beverage. Cheers. Cheers. Hope you do, like, do have something for yourself as well, too, uh, and to enjoy this morning's tea break with us as well, too. Uh, before we get, get cracking, uh, it's been a good year so far with our second session for the year, if I'm not mistaken. No, yeah, good. Uh, and we had um, a fantastic event last week, so I hope you'll go along to that, or otherwise looking forward to seeing uh, what we release through our social media and other other uh, internet devices regarding that event too. Um, similarly for Sustainability 3, um, do check online if you, if you missed that one too, and see, see our wrap-ups. Uh, if they haven't been up there already, they'll be coming soon, and the same thing we'll be doing for this one as well too. So do, do look at that, that stuff, and we really appreciate you doing so, and it really hits up what we're trying to do is, uh, at ASBN and, and share the good knowledge of sustainability throughout our community all around the place. Um, we are recording this session as we have been doing for the last few ones, so do keep that in mind, but we appreciate everyone coming along, uh, and as we keep along, any questions, we'll, we'll be having a session uh, after our little presentation. So, before we crack into the presentation, just throw it over to Yara and we'll make a good acknowledgement. Uh, so, thank you everyone, and uh, we acknowledge that we're meeting on the land of the Kana people, Tandanya, and we want to say Nina Mani, everyone, uh, and uh, share our respect to the elders and their knowledge and connection to country. So, from the past elders to the current ones to the emerging elders. Uh, we know that they all have a really special connection to country and to the land that they live on and that we now share with them. That, that deep knowledge of country, that understanding of place is something that will become really important in today's uh, It's something that is deeply influential in Passive House. And we look forward to Brett and his explanation of how that comes forth. So Brett, over to you. Thank you. Morning, everyone. So. There's, um, there's an Australian Passive House Association uh, that's known as AFA. So when you hear me say AFA, that's what I'm talking about. So I'm a member of AFA. I'm an architect. Um, I'm a certified Passive House designer. And I've just been made the South Australian uh, chapter rep of AFA. So this little presentation is, is kind of a mixture of slides that I've got from AFA and some of my own slides. So you can see there a couple of Passive House projects. So thanks for the introduction. Um, it's true that uh, I, I think Passive House is, is about um, climate responsive design with uh, like a building physics kind of overlay in a sense. Now here you can see passive house, uh, the house in passive house is actually, it actually means building in German. So it's not just about houses. So 19th century, you know, we, we, we had very basic um, houses that were essentially uncomfortable. There was poor air, like air quality, and they were very energy intensive. And then, you know, in the, the 20th century, houses were a lot more comfortable. The air quality was okay, but they were still very energy intensive and very, there was a lot of complex systems that got introduced into houses. So the passive house is for the 21st century, um, very comfortable buildings, great indoor air quality and low energy use. So th there are five key principles in a passive house. I'll go through them one at a time. So the first one is continuous insulation. So essentially what that means is it's unbroken uh, right around the, what I call the, the envelope, the building envelope. So just a bit of an example here um, in a drawing. So for example, when you've got wall insulation and then ceiling insulation, so that drawing on the left, 
It's important that the ceiling insulation goes right over the top of the wall insulation so there's a connection. The picture in the middle is, is an example of wrapping and then on the right, well-installed insulation. The next principle is airtight construction. So that uh, yellow layer represents an airtight barrier all the way uh, around the building envelope and that needs to be continuous. So there's an example of one of my projects with that uh, the, the white wrap called Intello, uh, which is wrapped around the interior of the home, and then somebody sealing up some gaps and an image of a blower door test. So minimizing thermal bridges is the next principle. So thermal bridge is essentially anywhere that's likely to, to leak uh, energy. So bridging energy, you imagine a, a piece of metal, for example, is a good conductor of heat. So you want to avoid sort of gaps in the insulation and any kind of uh, materials that conduct heat running from the inside to the outside. So an example in the drawing there, the concrete slab is potentially a thermal bridge at the edge. So if you could bring insulation up over the edge of the slab, um, that's gonna reduce the, the thermal bridge. And likewise with windows, if you've got window frames that are made from a PVC material or thermally broken aluminium, that's going to reduce the thermal bridging. The next one is high performance glazing. So that's fairly self-explanatory. Um, so now this is all uh, appropriate for climate. So in a very cold climate, it might be necessary to have triple glazing. Uh, in our climate here in South Australia, double glazing is, is enough. But it's also important to remember that the performance of the glazing is not only about the glass, it's also about the frame. So it's the total, the total system. The last one is mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. So this is a really important part of passive house. Once you've sealed up a house tight, then you have to ventilate it right in order to get good indoor air quality. So what you get is fresh air being delivered 24-7. Uh, and in order for that to be energy efficient, uh, you essentially need to extract the energy out of the exhaust air and transfer it into the delivery fresh air. So there's an example on the left, that slide is ductwork running through uh, one of my projects. Uh, in the center there, there's a little diagram of how a heat recovery system works. So it's an air to air system. And then on the right there is an example of a, what one of these units looks like. So passive house buildings are healthy because you've got constant fresh air. They're comfortable because you've got a stable temperature. They're low energy, um, up to 90% less energy than a conventional building. You get good quality because um, you need to construct carefully in order to hit all of these standards. And they're resilient because they're designed with building physics. So the materials themselves are protected from things like moisture. And it is for all building types, as I've said, it works everywhere. So it works for the local climate. Um, it's adjusted to the local climate. You use local climate data. It's been going for 30 years. So since 1991 in Germany, and it's now gone international. There are 80,000 buildings certified worldwide and counting. And it's therefore the most widely used sustainable design and construction system in the world. So there's a map of, of where they are all over the world. Uh, you can see there's lots of them. There's obviously concentration in Europe, but also North America and Canada. Uh, and there's a lot going on in China at the moment. And as you can see, um, starting to happen in Australia and New Zealand. Currently 31 buildings in New Zealand and 25 in Australia, uh, all in the, the different states. Um, these figures are, are kind of being updated regularly. You can see there's only one to date in South Australia. Um, I'll show you an image of that in a minute. So there is a database where you can look up passive houses. So it's passivehousedatabase.org. So this is a, a recent one. Um, something to note about this house is it's in between a railway line and a main road. And one great advantage of passive houses, because when you've well sealed a building, uh, it's also really good sound insulation. And then you don't need to have your doors and windows open for ventilation. So you can actually keep the noise out and still have good indoor air quality.
this one's in a, a bushfire region. I think it's um, yeah in the Blue Mountains, so about 40 um, combined with Passive House. I'll just move through these fairly quickly just to give you a sense that uh, it's very flexible what you do with, with design uh, to achieve the Passive House standard. So it's not limited to a, a type of design or a material. Uh, it's essentially very flexible. That one's uh, called Enerfit because you can also use it for retrofitting. So there's a, there's a standard where you can retrofit a house or a building. That's the first uh, South Australian one in 2013. There's a recent one uh, in Victoria. Here's the largest one in the multi-residential in the Southern Hemisphere to date. So that's the Fern Apartments in Sydney with a nice green atrium. There's the biggest one uh, in the Southern Hemisphere to date. So that's a 150 bed uh, university complex. Um, and I believe Monash University is, is now committed to doing all of their future buildings as passive house. Here's a large example of uh, a German project. So 3,700 apartments, a whole precinct. And there's a lot going on in China. So there's a, there's a whole city that's being developed, not only to passive house standard, but also to produce uh, passive house certified building products. So there's uh, 37 buildings there. So 3,000 apartments, and there's a planned uh, tower for Vancouver. So it really is going big scale around the world. So just a quick summary of those slides to date. Um, comfortable temperatures without heating is what you can achieve in a passive house. So they're, they're so energy efficient that you can get heating just from the sun uh, and the occupants and your toaster and your kettle and the like. Great air quality because you've got continuous filtered air and low energy bills. It's a global movement. Uh, there's a lot going on internationally and it's rapidly growing in Australia. So this is a, a project that I did with Enduro Builders and we had open for Sustainable House Day in 2019. Um, one of my projects, this project is not Passive House certified, but it's got all the principles of a Passive House. So I like to talk it as uh, this particular project about maximum performance, but also maximum value for money. Um, there's some more photos of the project. And in particular, you can see the, the blow door test going on there. And that was the result. So um, this house achieved the 0.6 air changes per hour, which is standard in the passive house. And interestingly, there you can see a few other um, sort of recommendations and benchmarks. So the National Construction Code here is recommending um, 10, it changes of or permeability of 10. And uh, the, the Australian benchmark done by the CSIRO is, is more like 15. So I've got a few other projects that are either passive house um, principles or going to be passive house certified. So here's one going up in Bridgewater. This one's going to have an indirect um, mechanical heat recovery ventilation system, so or, or decentralized system rather. So you, there's a couple of ways to do ventilation. This one's going up in Paynham and is under just started construction. That's a, a multi-generational home. Uh, this one's going up in Stirling and it's likely to be the first certified passive house that I do. That's it. Thank you, folks. Uh, Brett, we've had one question so far, uh, just in the chat, from Marek. Okay, here I am. Um, yeah, I'll just, I think everyone on the call came interested in passive house and most people would agree that's a gold standard, the best there can be. Yeah, I think we also agree it is uh, more expensive to build. So that my question is, you know, where, where do you think, where people think the sweet spot currently is for performance versus cost? And if you had a choice and if you could build um, a, a high, what I qualify high performance, and I guess you could argue what that is, but let's say less than three air changes an hour, building HRV, you know, quality glazing, framing, all the all the good things that can be uh, done, and would that provide um, comparable performance, quality, air quality to a true uh, passive house? 
So I'm just opening that up, uh, wondering what you think. So is your, is your question, um, at, at what point is it sort of, is that sweet spot between performance and cost? Yes. I mean, I've seen a lot of presentations from the sustainable house and a lot of solar presentations. A lot of people, you know, publish performance of their houses online so you can track the temperature. And it seems to me that a lot of those passive house, solar passive houses have, you know, fit in with their temperature just as as well as a passive house would, yeah. uh, which yeah. is, you know, that 90%. So, so I guess the question is, you know, how good is good enough? Is, is a sure. well-executed passive solar good enough for most people? And I guess that's subjective, sure. obviously, but, you know. Yeah. Look, I, I think the short answer is, is yes. Um, I mean, I think the passive house principles are building physics principles and they rely on good solar passive design to begin with. Um, and I guess it comes down a little bit to then lifestyle and personal choice so i talk about i say to people do you want to have the kind of house uh that you need to sail in a sense and open and close and interact with um or do you want to have the type of house that is a little bit more set and forget and also with a passive house you know you have the ability to to completely close it down in a really uh hot you know, heat wave conditions or really cold conditions, and it still performs well. So with a with a solar passive house, if, if you really close it down because the outside climate is extreme, uh, then you, you are likely to suffer a little bit of low air quality after a while. So that's my answer to that question. Excellent, um, thanks for that. And we did have an excellent question from Brian Clark as well. All right, would you speak okay. up? Sure. All right. Well, thanks, Brian, for your question there anyway. Uh, the question is, is my understanding correct that if the house is better insulated, it reduces the heat gain slash loss, is more energy efficient, and therefore there is less need for heating and cooling to maintain optimum comfortable living environment for the occupants, even in a passive house? I'm curious to understand why designers don't more frequently use better performing cost-effective alternatives, including higher R-value building envelopes using materials that minimize unwanted heat gain and loss. How do you take this into consideration when designing a passive house? That was a, a, a lot there, Brian. <laughs> sure, sure. Look, so essentially I think you're asking why don't designers and builders use high performance insulation? In, in better performing, yeah. better yeah. performing yeah. Yeah. in general. Yeah. yeah. So the heating envelope as a whole can be improved. And then yeah, look. An architect is something I absolutely Understand yeah, that. I totally agree. Um, you know, insulation is key. Um, what we're essentially trying to do with a solar passive house or with a certified passive house is have very good continuous insulation. So, yeah, I think the, the cost of in increasing, you know, the thickness or the performance of insulation is not generally a big cost. And I think it should be done as... as one of the first things that you do. So yeah, completely agree. Um, and then obviously with the passive house, all of those five principles have to be taken uh, as a complete system because if you just do one of them, um, you, you, you're going to be left with weaknesses in, in the other areas. Now, yeah. Brett, as, so I'm just going to jump in here and hijack the conversation because I'm running this show and I can. Um, and just from uh, an architect's point of view, do you find that um, the increased legislation, so the, the updated Section J in the NCC um, 2019, has that made a difference? Are builders actually upping their game or are we still fighting an uphill battle here? Uh, are you finding these conversations are easier to have now that we've got that sort of that backing of legislation behind us? Or is it still, because I've always found it really hard to do what Brian is suggesting, to up-spec things. Um, you always come up against a client or builder that says, oh, why would we pay extra for better insulation? Why do we have to put in, like, we don't have to put in double glaze. We can get away with something cheaper. Um, that's the first and, yeah, that's, like that, yeah. So the conversation around value, so long-term value versus the short-term expenditure uh, has always been challenging. Yeah. One that's improving. 
Well, yeah, I'd say it's definitely improving. I mean, I, I've been designing energy efficient buildings for 20 years. Um, and I think, you know, the code has been improving over that time, which is great. But also people are coming to me and, and asking for higher, higher levels of performance. So I think, you know, the level of education of, of the general public is increasing and people are expecting more, which is great. Um, but I think it's a big issue there. It's, it's about, you know, if it's developer led, then essentially what they're doing is, is trying to keep costs as low as possible. Um, so I think that's always going to be an issue with developer led housing that's for profit. Um, so, you know, I think the legislation is there as a minimum. There's a bit of a, a bit of a concern though, when, when there's no um, accountability for the way that insulation or, you know, the performance is, is checked. So that's the great thing about the passive house standard is that there's accountability there. In, a, in order to get a certification for a passive house, the documentation has to be right. The thermal model has to be right. But then there also has to be a lot of photographic evidence of the documentation during construction. And then obviously the blower door test at the end to, to test the final result. So I think it's important to, to bring those kind of levels of accountability into the building code. Exactly right, have that commitment. Uh, and we did have some interesting comments in the chat that I might just read out. So we had a comment from George, uh, who's the VP of a National Trust, and they're really interested in making existing heritage buildings more efficient without damaging their heritage. Uh, do you have any comments or recommendations to George as to how they can do that? Is, is that something that Passive House can help with? Yes, it is. Um, I mean, there's a lot of building stock in the world that exists, and that's why there's a, a retrofit standard for passive house. Um, the expected level of performance is slightly lower, so you don't need to get quite as airtight in order to achieve that benefit standard. And there's there's lots of ways that you can improve uh, the performance of an old building. So you can you can air seal, for example, in a way that's um, aesthetically sensitive and you can also insulate in ways that are aesthetically sensitive so you might be insulating for example uh, on the inside of the building rather than on the outside if the if the outside is um, of heritage importance so yeah there's it's a little bit more complicated obviously but there's ways around it yeah and that's that's precisely what jackson's response was uh, in the chat again he said that there's good examples in, in europe that we can look at um, I know that there's one good example in Adelaide of uh, a retrofit, but that was the Green Star accreditation in Lot 14 that wasn't um, passive house, but I think they still had good outcomes. Not sure how closely monitored they are, uh, which brings me neatly to my next question. And if anyone else wants to ask any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in and, and hijack the conversation like I'm doing. Uh, but just in terms of, um, uh, you, you're talking about uh, the specification and, and you know, having photographic evidence and all that. And I know that other systems have an ongoing monitoring requirement as part of the certification. Is that true for Passive House as well? Um, ongoing monitoring in the sense of, do you mean after the building has been occupied? Yeah, that's right. So the perform ongoing performance of the building. Yeah. No, that's not a requirement of the Passive House standard. Um, the understanding is that the software um, is quite sophisticated so the the accuracy of the position of the um, prediction is high uh, and so uh, provided that the building gets built um, in accordance with that specification level uh, the final test required is the air tightness and then after that you can get certification now Again, if anyone else has questions, feel free. But um, I often wonder with passive house, and it's something we touched on briefly before the, the whole conversation sort of started. We talked about uh, orientation, connection to place, knowing where you are and designing for context. Uh, it's not really something you touched on, on the, in the presentation. You really focus on the passive house principles. But can you, I know that you've got the experience. You, I think you worked with uh, John Maitland at some point, or uh, you're aware of his work as well. Uh, can you just expand on that, that aspect of your design, the more holistic approach to sustainability, which is not just about energy efficiency, and how well does Passive House um, slide into that? Sure. Yeah, look, so I, I, 
I strongly believe that um, passive house is, is a building physics understanding of the performance of buildings. And in order to get the best performance out of a building, you need to go back to the first principles of, uh, you know, sun and shade, for example. I guess, um, you know, there one of the main principles of, of some uh, kind of warm climate design is, is cross ventilation. So I guess that's one of the things that's perhaps not so necessary with the, the passive house standard, but certainly uh, insulation is very important and shading is very important. Um, something that's different about passive house is that thermal mass doesn't become as important because thermal mass tends to rely on a, a, a fluctuation of temperature. So in the passive house standard, it's not so important. But I think it's, you know, in our, in our climate in particular, it's very important to get the shading right because when you've got a very well insulated house, uh, there is a risk of overheating. So I think the shading design is, is really important. Interestingly, with passive house, um, one it is in some ways a little bit more forgiving uh, in the sense that you don't need as much sun um, to enter a passive house because they're so well insulated and air sealed. You don't need as much sun. So you can actually use it in cases where you don't have good access to, to you know, north sun in winter, for example. So there are some design flexibilities that you get out of the, um, the building physics approach. So the, the, the sort of the sophistication, I guess, of the building physics approach um, means that you can fine tune things to the, to the local climate and site conditions. Um, yes, we had some uh, comments on, a few more comments on the heritage fabric and, and um, a bit of a conversation happening in the chat around that. Ken, do you want to jump in and just so we can hear your voice, your lovely voice and see your pretty face? And tell us a bit more about what's happening in lot 14 and answer Kay's question. I don't know who Kay is, uh, who asks us to uh, repeat the name and location of the Enerfit example in Adelaide. So Kay, just to um, clarify, it's not an Enerfit example. It's just a heritage retrofit that was done really well in lot 14. And Ken, if you're able to jump on and, and just explain about that a bit more. And look at that, what a lovely view. Awesome. That's right. Um, and hopefully you won't get too much wind. No, I just wanted to, because you brought it up, Yara um, and D squared, we're working on a lot of the uh, lot 14 projects. And um, the first lot that we actually had to do were all the heritage buildings. So all the heritage buildings alongside um, North Terrace. And um, we did both uh, pre-tests for um, allied, allied health, allied health, and then also um, uh, women's health buildings, and they were sitting at around like 30 to 38 uh, air changes per hour <laughs> for those yeah, right. for those buildings. And then um, and then once we improved the fabric um, and making sure that the like added insulation, um, sealing gaps where we can because a heritage building we can't touch the windows. Um, uh, we were able to lower it down to between like 10 and 14 across that, and then every single building from here on out because of Green Star will have to do a blower door test. Um, so we're making sure that we're at least, you know, comfortably under about 15 or 14 air changes per hour. The, the new commercial buildings, of course, would be a much better than that. But I think having the air, cha air changes per hour on heritage buildings is something to um, at least applaud uh, for, for those. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, uh, obviously that helps a lot with um, uh, the energy efficiency of like the, the active systems and all that kind of stuff. So just wanted to shout that out, um, that improvements can be made. And um, I think this conversation around uh, air tightness testing and stuff like that is really beneficial across the board, um, not just for uh, people targeting passive house, but I think passive house standard is the one that has really outlined the importance of testing the building fabric. That's all. Yeah. Thanks very much. They can. Great to see your face. 
Um, I just j jump out back in here. We'll, we've spoken a couple of times about certification and whatnot too. Can, can you just uh, clarify a bit, of, a bit of an overview of, of how that happens with patterns of plastic casts there, Brett? Um, we've mentioned about like air tightness testing and the like too, but is that the only only thing or is there a few other things in the process to get a building certified plastic casts that needs to be done? Sure. So um, the, the process of reaching certification, um, first of all, I'll say this that you need to have uh, an external certifier do that. So they need to be a, a registered certifier. There are currently only two people in Australia that are registered to do that. Um, they're both in Victoria. So the process is that you, you need to engage them um, fairly early on. Uh, there's, a, there's a piece of software called the Passive House Planning Package so you need to enter all of the, the data of the building into that package. So that package looks at the, the building form. Uh, it looks at shading. It looks at materials. It looks at performance. Um, so there's a, there's a heating and cooling uh, requirement. So you need to demonstrate that you get a pass uh, in that software, first of all, and then uh, during construction, like I said before, you need it. So if, if the certifier uh, can't be on site, um, you need to do a lot of photographic evidence and then that gets compiled into a report. Um, and along with the, the blower door test, that goes back to the certifier and then the certifier uh, signs it off if you pass and then that gets registered back to Germany to the international database. Yeah, excellent. Thanks for that, Brett. And the other one had in mind myself too was you mentioned the building um, previously that uh, just before I was using passive house principles, but was more green star um, aligns. Brett, how would you say passive house would um, kind of compare and align with other, uh, whether national or international um, building principles certifications as well too? Would be better, worse, or others being better or worse? So look, I work in the domestic space, so I guess I can compare it to NatHERS, for example. I don't know a lot about Green Star, um, so somebody like Ken might be better to, to comment in comparison with something like Green Star. But in comparison with something like NatHERS, um, NatHERS is a you know, it's a reasonably sophisticated sort of calculation engine, but there are some, some, I guess, some people argue that, it, that it's not as accurate and it needs um, updating. But certainly one thing with the NatHer system is it doesn't assume that you're going to be occupying the rooms 24-7, um, so it allows bedroom occupation at, at night, for example, and living room occupation during the day um so yeah it's just it's, it's a slightly different approach in terms of the building physics um and there's there's currently no sort of uh minimum air change requirement in in the nat system so i would say that the passive house system is is a, a little bit more sophisticated in terms of its building physics and its prediction of performance than than the nat system um, but they're, they're sort of, they're both valid in a way. Um, and so it, it's good to be aware of both. Does anybody want to comment on the, the Green Star compared with Passive House? I think the, the main difference with Green Star is that it's more holistic. So it, it does consider building envelopes, obviously, in, in materiality, but it has other considerations as well. Uh, sure. Side context. Um, water, so things that, that Passive House doesn't focus on. Uh, so yeah, it does look at a bigger picture. Ken, if you've got anything to add to what I just said, feel free to jump in. Uh, I was also going to dob in one of my colleagues, Renee, on this one. Uh, but I'll just quickly kind of say that um, uh, for Green Star, they do have across Green Star, well building and living building challenge, all of those um, systems on a commercial scale uh, work very well with Passive House. So Passive House 
um, standard can really set them up for uh, for any any project pursuing Living Building Challenge, uh, Green Star, well, even LEED. Um, it sets them up to a really good spot because of the energy efficiency and air quality. Um, and furthermore, so Green Star had Green Star has included air tightness testing as a requirement going forward. So you'll see that language coming in. It's just that they don't, they don't require as, as a stringent of performance on the air tightness and thermal bridging and stuff like that. Um, so it's almost, it's almost sort of like, because it's a little, little bit more holistic, it's also um, uh, at certain areas, acknowledging what programs um, really set the ultimate performance like for Passive House. So they're like working in conjunction with all of that. Um, so that's just to add into there. But um, Renee, if you want to also go off mute and want to uh, add a little bit in there, uh, go ahead. Uh, as you and also Ken mentioned, uh, uh, Korean Star is more holistic, looking on other aspects and performance, building performance or energy efficiency of the building uh, alone. Well, uh, yeah, passive houses. Yeah, focusing on the building performance and creating like healthy and uh, comfortable indoor environments. And yeah, probably the energy efficiency is just a side product or waste product of it. Um, so, and yeah, so in that context and, and as Ken mentioned, it sets up well uh, buildings that wanna achieve uh, more holistic sustainability uh, ratings like well, uh, Green Star and LEED and yeah, in regards to, to the energy efficiency. So that's what, what a lot projects do is like in, in terms of performance going for the passive house because it's with its uh, 50, 15 uh, watt per square meter and year um, energy consumption it's a really low bar or it's, it's, or it's a high bar at the end, it's, it's a really low value. And um, buildings then only need to put on a small amount of uh, solar for heating and cooling to achieve that. Um, yeah, so Passive House, in my opinion, as Passive House designer as well, <laughs> it's the way to go and then, yeah, it's, it, it should, leads the way in that area, definitely. Yeah, uh, it should it should be more considered when when planning project. Absolutely, thanks for that, Renee. And we we had a similar comment or question from Brian, uh, again asking why we as designers don't actually use higher spec or higher performance uh, glazing insulation, etc. And and Brian really comes down to the bottom line. Uh, but we we are seeing more better educated clients and more appetite in the market. Uh, for that higher level of performance. And, you know, double glazing is no longer a dirty word. Uh, it's something we can actually say to the clients and they, they don't sort of uh, walk off in a half. So it's, it is getting better, but it is uh, an uphill battle for us. And, and uh, initiatives like Passive House definitely help to pave the way by showing us that it can be done, it does have a positive impact, and this is a clear way of, of doing it, and these are clear benefits. So it's fantastic. And um, we also had another comment from George recommending a good paper from Europe about energy efficiency in heritage buildings uh, by Thomas Horn, I think is his name, uh, Lolia University. I have no idea how to pronounce this story. George, if you want to jump up and, and sort of correct my pronunciation, feel free. Conversely, if anyone wants to go to the chat and just cut and paste uh, those names that I completely butchered, uh, feel free to do so. We might wrap up the conversation for now and uh, feel free to keep chatting to each other and to us. Keep the conversation going. Thank you, Ken, for joining us live from the beach. <laughs> Much appreciated. On your day off, no less. Yeah. Thanks to everyone yeah, for your yeah. time in, in, the, in the middle of a work day. Much appreciated. Yes, thank you, Ken Mabelin. Uh, and so much. Uh, yes. So much info. Excellent. <laughs> Such a tease. Uh, yep. Yeah, cool. Thanks so much, Ken, guys. Uh, yeah, great to see the community working so well. And we'll love to see you all again at events like this and our events in the future. Um, and a huge special thanks to Brett for his time and effort in putting the presentation together and sharing his vast knowledge with us. Uh, Especially with Brett, Brett's uh, position there too, recently taking on the Passive House Australia representative um, position there too, and, and 
and using Ken's affectionate words of the godfather of the ASBN being the original founder. <laughs> so thanks again to Brett for, for being with us today, and thanks very much for everyone's words too. Hope you have a lovely Wednesday, and we'll catch you on our next session of sustainability or another ASBN event. Thanks, guys. Thank you.